Well, we're continuing tonight looking at the Baptist faith and message. And the past couple weeks, we looked at the doctrine of Scripture. The second article is the doctrine of God. So we're looking at the doctrine of God. You've got a handout there. Now, if you notice on the doctrine of God, there's a general statement about who God is. There's a statement about God the Father, about God the Son, and about God the Spirit. Tonight, we're going to look at just the first statement, just a general statement about God. That's on the, the front page. And then, Lord willing, next week, we'll look at God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I will say, when I was first thinking about teaching the Baptist faith and message, I saw, well, there's 18 articles. Okay, 18 weeks. That makes sense. And then... Last week on scripture, well, it took two weeks, and then get to the doctrine of God, and, and there's four parts to it. The rest of them are simpler, but when we think about the doctrine of God, who is God? What does he do? Build yourself to us. So help us. There is one and only one living and true God. He is an intelligent, spiritual, and personal being, the creator Redeemer, creatures. To him we owe the highest love, reverence, and obedience. To us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with distinct personal attributes, but without division of nature, essence, or being. And with all your might, the word Lord is sometimes all in lower caps. You ever see it came to us from Hebrew through German or Latin and German into English as Jehovah. Our team had a coach named, uh, what was his name, Yuri or Jurgen or something like that. Or Yahweh, but our Bibles call this the Lord. Now, before we unpack this idea of who God is, I want to circle back around to something I said last week. It's all about summarizing what the Bible says. It's not inerrant truth. The book of the Bible inspired even the way that we think of the Bible inspired. And so I'll give you an example. So we, we do this today. Now, I don't think that's what the Bible does. Let me be very clear. I don't think that. 20. But you don't say, you know, History Channel, they're just a bunch of liars. The faith, and he'd say, well, I don't fully agree with that. Now, go through with a red marker like Thomas Jefferson is exceedingly difficult to understand because God is past our understanding. No matter what I say, beyond our ability to understand, absolutely right, limited in our language. So when it comes to a statement about an idea, he's a person. And yet, we have to put up guardrails because the scripture does tell us very true things about And if somebody denies the do everything, they may have never considered any of these things. They're inaccurate. That's good and helpful. So with a confession, just generally, I'm not sure. But here's the main idea from our statement of faith. So if we get this, this main idea box, no, he's, he's God. And it teaches that God having some humility and caution is very important. You, you may, she was explaining that you can think of the Trinity like you think of an egg. It's got a part. Well, there's a problem with either the Father, but sometimes he's the Son, and sometimes he's the Spirit. That's not what the Scripture teaches either. So that analogy just, I mean, it doesn't work. And like I said, looking at the actual confession of faith, it's in other places. Uh, we, we see this in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 10 through 8, Savior. We also see in Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, uh, we see this. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish. He's talking about idols here. And gold from Euphaz. They're the work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the goldsmith. Their clothing is violet and purple. They are all the work of skilled men, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes, and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Thus you shall say to them, the gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and under the sea. Uh, 
likewise we see in 1 Corinthians. Now I won't read these passages in full, but if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul's addressing the church and the idea of eating meat sacrificed to idols. Uh, we, we won't talk about that per se tonight. But what he tells them is, you know, listen, there's only one God. The so-called gods of the other nations, they're not a real thing. They're, they're not really gods. And then he tells them in chapter 10, actually, you want to really get to the root of it, all the other gods that the nations claim to worship, whether it's Zeus or Baal or, you know, pick any other god that exists today from Hinduism or other things. He said, in reality, those are actually demons. So it's not that they correspond merely to imagination. He said, actually, there are supernatural beings behind false worship, and they're demons. He said, don't have anything to do with that. And so again, you can look that up in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 4 through 6, and then again, 1 Corinthians 10, 19 through 22. Uh, so there is one God. There is only one true God or living and true God. Now, what do we see about God? We see that he is, the next sentence, he is an intelligent, spiritual, and personal being, the creator, redeemer, preserver, and ruler of the universe. Now, God is not merely a force. It's not some impersonal force. There's not some cosmic soup of just material energy that we can conceive of and say, well, we'll just call that God. An example of this, I was listening to a podcast on Monday where a guy was talking about Albert Einstein's view of God. I've heard many well-meaning Christians point to how faith and science don't actually contradict, and they'll say, well, Albert Einstein believed in God. Well, he did, but when he defined God, he defined it as all of the power and force of physics and all that that exists beyond what we can know and that's what he considered God. He didn't believe in a personal God, in other words. At best, you could say he was a deist. So I mentioned Thomas Jefferson earlier. Uh, if you want to read Thomas Jefferson on political theory, I think he's brilliant. But you can't trust him on everything. Uh, you know, it's kind of like you may have a good mechanic who can work on your car. You probably don't want him, or you may not want him. I don't know the mechanic. Maybe you have a great Christian mechanic who's a Sunday school teacher. I don't know. But just because he's good at working on cars doesn't mean he knows the Bible. Same thing with Thomas Jefferson. Again, he argued that God was an impersonal God. He was a being. He believed that God had a being, so he wasn't just some mystical cosmic soup, whatever. But his idea of God, like other deists, was he's like a watchmaker. At the beginning, he created the world. He wound up the watch or the clock, and he set it on the table, and that's it. And we're governed by just the forces of nature and gravity and bad luck. Well, that's not who the Bible presents as God at all. God is active. He, he's a being. He's personal. And he's active. Notice what our confession says. It's not just that he's a personal being. He's the creator. But also the redeemer. The preserver. And ruler of the universe. Now, we're going to talk about God the Son next week. But I at least want to bring this discussion around to make sure we're understanding this is also talking about Jesus. And we see in Colossians chapter 1, listen to what it says about Jesus in Colossians, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things. Now listen to this. And in him all things hold together. We also see in Hebrews, we won't read it for the sake of time, that Jesus himself is currently upholding the universe by the word of his power. So the fact that you're breathing right now on a personal level is because God is keeping you alive by his power. When rain falls, you know, we think, oh, gravity. Gravity makes the rain fall. If we want to be honest, gravity is what we use to describe the natural phenomenon that God causes things to fall to the earth. It is God doing it. We see it happen regularly. We expect it. We can kind of explain it. We can, we can measure it. But we also, as Christians, think, you know what? It's actually God. 
We got rain Sunday night. You know, we've been praying for rain. God answered our prayer. Wasn't that great? Pray he sends some more. Amen. God sends the rain and he makes the raindrops fall. We need to make sure natural things that we can study and observe. If you've ever had children, we know that the Lord gives the fruit of the womb. That's from the Lord. Now, we can talk about chromosomes. We can talk about different cells and what they do and how they divide. And was it mitosis? It's been a long time since I had biology. Is it mitosis, meiosis, something like that? Oh, well. There, we got a scientist back there, yeah. Kim, you, you know, right? It's been a long time since I had <laughs> You know, we can take cells. We can look at them under a microscope. And that's spiritual. So he doesn't have a body. Now, just a quick caveat. We're going to look at God the Son next week. Jesus Christ today has a body. He's got a physical body. But God, as he exists as God, is not limited to a physical body. He's not part of creation. He's outside of creation. God's also outside of time. Now, this one, I can't wrap my mind around. Maybe one day someone will explain it to me. The best I've ever come close to trying to understand that God is outside of time is an analogy R.C. Sproul gave of Imagine there's a parade, okay, so you, everybody knows what a parade is, right? You've got the different floats, and they're going down the road. From our perspective, we're standing on the sidewalk, and we're watching the parade go by. God's perspective of history would be as if he were in a blimp or a helicopter above the parade. And he... ...analogy, because God's not just looking at a timeline. He is looking at the present, and he's acting in the present. And every moment to God, in some sense, is present. So 2,000 years ago and 2,000 years from now are, in God's sense of things, both the present. Now, I can't explain that. I, you know, it, God also talks about time, though. He relates to it in ways that we can understand. But the point I'm trying to get home is he is beyond us. Now, the word that theologians use for this, maybe you've heard this word, is called transcendence. Now, if we break that word up, you can think of to descend is to go down, to ascend is to go up. God is transcendent. He goes across, and he's over, and he's above, and he, he is through creation. He's not just standing over it, detached from it. He's everywhere, including in this room. He's at home right now, your house. But he's also in heaven. He's everywhere. You know, we can't really wrap our minds around this. Again, I, I'm going to sound like an idiot on some of this stuff because it's just beyond me. Uh, so we believe it. We embrace it. We don't necessarily understand it. And we can't make sense of it. But we know it's true. So he's transcendent. But we also have to remember God is imminent. So that's not imminent like, oh, it's going to rain imminently. It's I-M-M -M, and then the letter A, imminent. Like you think of Emmanuel, everybody's heard the word Emmanuel at Christmas time, God with us. God is imminent in that he is with us, present, active, involved in your life. So when you have heartache, when you have good things happen to you, God is there and he's present and he's, he cares and he's actively involved in our lives. So Unlike the deists, you know, a deist would say, yeah, sure, God's transcendent, but he's not imminent. He's we have plants? Well, we did. I was going to point to a plant. Plants are kind of part of God life, and everything is just part of God, and we're all kind of ascending to this. I don't want to even spend time. So God is a being. He's personal. He's active. When we come to, well, let me, let me make sure I read everything in that, um, in that statement there. So he's the ruler of the universe. God is also infinite in holiness and all other perfections. Again, that speaks to his transcendence. And God is all-powerful and all-knowing. So again, he's omniscient. He knows all things. He's omnipotent. He can do all things. By the way, let me just uh, say this. I, I remember, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this silly argument. You know, I had a philosophy class in college, and the professor thought he was so smart that he could, you know, kind of laugh at the idea of God because he said, well, if God is omnipotent, he's all-powerful, 
Can God make a rock so big that he can't move it? And his point was, well, if he can make the rock so big he can't move it, well, then he can't move it. So he's obviously not all powerful. But then if he can't make a rock so big that he can't move it, then he's also not powerful. You know, these are, honestly, these are just word games, right? They're word games. God, God could not possibly make a rock so big he can't move it because he's omnipotent. So we don't have to play the word game. Uh, God could make a rock bigger than our universe. But no matter how big the rock he made, he could move it. That's not because he's limited. It's because the rock will always be limited. The rock is finite. No matter how big it is, it would always only be a creature. He will always be infinite. So word games like that, maybe you've got a clever family member or friend or somebody you know on Facebook who's always posting you know, these clever, so-called clever atheist little sound bites. You can roll your eyes at them and just keep scrolling. Just don't pay me any attention. So God's all powerful. He's all knowing. Now we come to this next part and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to at least address it here. This was added to the Baptist faith and message in the year 2000 or a part of this was, and there's good reason for it. So the next sentence after that is, so it says God is all powerful and all knowing and his perfect knowledge extends to all things past present and future including the future decisions of his free creatures now we won't spend too much time on this we'll talk about the doctrine of man we are free god has given us freedom we have natural freedom i can wake up tomorrow morning and i can choose to put on a blue shirt i can put on a red shirt if i'm feeling really squirrely i can walk around with no shirt i can tell you that's not the one i'm going to choose but uh you know, God knows which color shirt I'm going to put on tomorrow morning. He knows it. It's a settled fact in his mind. Because he can't know something that's not true. I have not yet made that decision. And I will freely make that decision. And God knows the decision I will make. And he doesn't know anything false. So the, de the decision of which shirt I'm going to wear tomorrow... I will freely make that decision. No question. Well, my wife might give me some input. So I say freely, but, you know, you get the idea, right? But God knows the decision. And it would be impossible for me to choose the other color shirt. Now, how do we explain that? The answer, we can't. We can't explain it. And, you know, we just have to live with it. Are your choices free choices? Yes, they're free choices. Now, there's a lot, that, again, we'll talk about the doctrine of man. There's a lot that goes into our free choices. Tomorrow morning, if you gave me the free choice of eating watermelon or eating eggs, 100 times out of 100, I'm going to choose the eggs because I do not like watermelon. Now, I can make a free choice, but I'm always going to choose what I want to do. I will never, ever, ever choose to eat watermelon, period. I will go very, very hungry before I would ever eat a watermelon. Uh, and growing up in South Georgia, let me tell you, Watermelon was the dessert of choice growing up, and I was always like, great. No cookies, no ice cream. we got to eat this poison fruit again. Gee whiz. Anyway, so we have freedom, but our, even our freedom has other influences. Again, let me just table that for later. The point is this. God's knowledge of the future is he knows what will happen for certain. Now, just a little bit of background. The reason this was added to the Baptist faith and message is because in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, many began teaching what might be called open theism or process theology, which basically said God can't know the future because it hasn't happened yet. And so many, before this was added, many were in the Baptist ranks. I think, I don't want to go too far here. I think there may have even been some Southern Baptist faculty at some of our seminaries who held to this idea that, well, God can't know the future because it hasn't happened yet. And so in a way to guard against error, again, that's why we have a confession, to guard against error, right? This was added as a helpful guardrail to say, wait a second. If you don't believe that God knows the future, you don't quite understand and believe God the way we do. Now, again, if you think that's what Scripture teaches, your conscience is free, I would show from Scripture I think that you're incorrect. Matter of fact, let me just do that real fast. 
Isaiah, just a couple of examples here. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 8 through 10. This is a hundred years before declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. So again, you can go back and read the context of Isaiah 46. He's telling Isaiah that in the future, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and destroy Jerusalem. And God's already declared that it will happen. And he knows it. And it's fixed. We can also see this in Exodus. So this, this one's kind of mind-blowing here. But it's what the Bible shows us. Uh, so Moses is uh, in Exodus chapter 4. He's speaking with the Lord. In the beginning of verse 21, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, Let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn. So notice what the Lord says to Moses there. By the way, I, I say this with kind of fear and trembling. I mean, this is, this is not an easy thing to understand. I would submit to you that we can't fully understand this. He tells Moses, go back to Egypt, do all these things before Pharaoh. And he says, but I, the Lord speaking, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Again, not to get too far down this rabbit trail again, we'll look at it. Pharaoh freely of his own will chose not to let the people go. But when the Lord is describing this event to Moses, he's guaranteeing, he knows the future, he's guaranteeing it's going to happen. He wants Moses to be prepared. God describes it to Moses this way, that I will harden his heart. Now, again, God is not the author of evil. So we cannot say that God calls Pharaoh to murder the firstborn infants of the Hebrews. We would never say that God causes anyone to do evil. But when the way he's describing it to Moses is that it's such a certain thing, God says, I will harden his heart. These are mysteries. So we just have to be humble about God is bigger than you and me. And so we tremble. We tremble at who he is. There are more places we can look um, you know, Isaiah chapter 64 describes God as the potter, and we are the clay. For Christians, this is good news, right? It's good news that God is shaping us. I am glad. Let me just say, getting back to God and human freedom. Um, when we think about these things, we tend to want to find fault with God. I think we're looking at it the wrong way if we do that. The better thing to do is say this. God, I am so glad that you have the ability to soften my heart and change me to make me willing to do what is good and right. So it, it shouldn't be a, a thing where we try to find fault with God or nitpick or how does sovereignty interact with freedom. What we do is we affirm God's sovereignty and we say, thank you, God, for changing my heart. Thank you for softening me. Thank you for convicting me of sin. Thank you for redeeming me even though I was lost and dead. Can we reconcile it? No, but we say, you're God and I'm not. And I'm thankful that you're God and I'm not. Well, last thing we'll look at and then um, we'll be concluding tonight. The last statement here is the eternal triune God reveals himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with distinct personal attributes but without division of nature, essence, or being. So that's kind of a mouthful. What that means is, if we want to summarize it, God is one God, and in a way that's mysterious to us, he is three persons in that one Godhead. And they are three distinct persons. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. But they are all three one God, not distinct gods. So it's not three gods of God. Again, it's, uh, we, can, we can actually see in the scripture a couple places. Person of Jesus, fullness of deity, fullness of humanity right here. Heavens are open to him. And he saw the spirit. 
and coming to rest on him. So the Spirit of God is not the Son, but it's God. He is God. I say it. He is God. So the Spirit comes to rest on him, and behold, a voice from heaven. It was not his voice, not the Spirit. A voice from heaven. This is the Father saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So at the inauguration of Jesus' ministry, we see him, fully God, fully man, being baptized. By the way, he was immersed. You know, he was baptized. So he was baptized like a dove. What does that mean? I, I'm not sure, but that's not the point. The Spirit is coming down upon him, and then he hears the voice of the Father in heaven. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. We see here, right, just... come back to kind of what we said at the beginning about we, we want to say what the Bible says is true. We want to guard against what the Bible says is not true. And everything else we kind of have to hold with an open hand. When God reveals things to us about himself, we want to say, Lord, I believe. Help me understand. Help me obey. But I believe. If you have a settled conviction to the contrary, so let me use the example of Jehovah's Witnesses or, or Mormons. I've talked about Hindus and some others, but these are people who would claim to be Christians. Well, there's a problem. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you believe Jesus was created by God the Father. And he's not one with the Father the way we understand it. So we have this confession, which is helpful, because if someone came on Sunday morning, they listened. I want to be a member here, but I, I do not believe Jesus is eternally preexistent. I think he was created by God. And we would say to him, uh, brother? No, we wouldn't call him brother. No, sorry. We would say to him, sir, we're so glad you come. Uh, but we have to protect our church. We certainly can't let you teach. And it wouldn't be appropriate for you to be with us, not as a member, not in good fellowship. And so again, this is where... Do we all have things to learn? Absolutely. But if someone has a settled conviction to the contrary, we want to say what Scripture says. We want to affirm that. But we also just want to be humble and recognize every one of us at some point believed and presently does believe or think about God in some way that's not perfectly accurate. As long as we're open to being corrected, we're, we're good. Well, I have asked my wife to... Um, I'm putting her on the spot here a little bit. Um, there is a hymn that's a relatively new hymn. I say relatively new. It's written in the past 15, 20 years. I don't know. Verse 1. Here we go. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God seated on his throne. Come let us adore him. Behold our King. Nothing can compare Verse 3, who has 
felt the nails on his hands. Who has felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man? God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to